Hey guys, Osam here. Just very quickly before we start, Guillaume and I have partnered up with Automation Boutique to write a brand new ebook for you guys called Going Beyond the Buzzwords. It's an amazing ebook that goes through all the things about automation, data, and processing that just simplifies the topics just in the way that we do all the time in Corporate Treasury 101. To pick up your copy, just go into the show notes and click on the link or go to the website and find the partners page where we have a link to the ebook there as well with Automation Boutique. And then here's the episode. Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. This is the first part of our full interview with Royston da Costa, where we discuss digitization in treasury, past, present, and future. In the episode of today, expect to learn the current landscape of treasury and where digital transformation fits in. What are the primary drivers pushing treasury departments to adopt digital tools and solutions today? What have been the most significant benefits of embracing the digitization of treasury operations? What challenges has Ferguson faced in its journey towards treasury digitization and how were they addressed? And of course, much, much more. Roy Stone has been absolutely lovely and definitely knows a lot about technology and cybersecurity. As a member of the Treasury Dragons, that was to be expected. We hope you will enjoy the episode. If that is the case, and when you're thinking about how you found our podcast, chances are that it was through word of mouth, social media, or a recommendation from your favorite podcast platform. And this is our only request to you. The best way you can support the podcast is to head to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Corporate Treasury 101. That will mean the world to us and help more people learn about treasury. And with all that being said, please welcome Royston da Costa. Royston, thank you so much for joining us on the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. Um, to begin with, maybe, could you provide us with an overview of the current landscape of Treasury and where digital transformation fits in, please? Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for inviting me to this podcast. I've been really excited and looking forward to it. So the way I would like to approach this is to try and just map out what I see as some of the drivers for where we are today. And I'm not by any means or an IT expert or a technology expert in this respect. But I think this is fairly clear to a lot of people that you know, know anything about technology today. So Web 1, I believe, is what where the internet first began back in the 90s, let's say. And Web 1 is commonly known as basically where you kind of went on there just to find out information. People looked, at, looked uh, to search for data. So it's pretty much one-way traffic. The read-only web is another way a type was looked at. Web 2, which I would say probably is 2000 onwards, is where it became the participative social web, where basically you, you know, people were going on the web and in inquiring, looking for data. It was basically participating and contribution. So there's a two-way flow going on there. What's exciting in my view is Web 3. And it is happening as we speak. It's not quite fully evolved, but Web3 is what they call the read, write, and execute web. And this is what's shaping a lot of what we're seeing with technology today. And we haven't even got to AI, by the way, but I'm hoping that, you know, by building this kind of background to where we are today, it'll help hopefully your listeners to, and certainly it helped me to kind of frame how the world's changing and evolving and what we need to be looking at going forward. So it's very important to recognize that with Web3, it's the first time in its evolution in terms of, in, not just in terms of technology, but what they envisage is individuals like you and me and corporates for that matter, anyone using the internet will become responsible for their own data, which is a very important commodity, in fact, as you all know, because companies pay a lot of money to have your data. So that's where I'll stop because I know there's a lot more information on that you can research yourselves, but... The next area I'd like to cover is particularly in terms of treasury, what's driven treasury's engagement technology, in my view. And I would go back to the economic crisis of 2008. And in, and in many respects, it, it affected Ferguson as much as most other corporates, I would say. Why 2008? Well, 
we had some major changes uh, following the, the economic crisis of, the, of that two, 2008 in that we had a change in senior management. And like most corporates, we had an internal review what we needed to do to become more efficient, become more uh, profitable and so on and so forth. One of the outcomes from that re internal review was at our, looking at our technology landscape. Now, to be clear, I mean, I've worked for other blue chip international companies in, in previously, but up to that point in Ferguson, we used to be called Wolfley, by the way, we'd only implemented a cash pooling structure and a TMS solution. We didn't really have the 13 cloud-based solutions we have today and the automation we have today. So even though we had some technology in place, the CFO that came in at the time quickly identified that he the technology we had our landscape was not very in his view, view slick it wasn't as automated as he would have wanted it to be so that was the initial driver in that he wanted us to make sure that in the treasury function we could evolve to become much more automated and that was that was critical actually in terms of the sponsorship we received in treasury and in, in some to some degree the role i then adopted to drive our technology development and our journey within Ferguson. The next uh, master in my view, as far as technology generally was uh, regulation and open banking in 2017, that was then brought out by the, by, the, by the UK government has also helped, I believe, to drive some of the changes that we're now seeing, particularly with FinTechs entering the industry and being able to partner or at least uh, collaborate with banks. And I still feel there's a lot of work there that still needs to be done, particularly, in my view, on the banking side. But we'll, we'll come to that hopefully later on in the podcast. The last piece, no surprise, the pandemic. Well, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I'm sure everyone recognizes that, uh, that saying. But, um, and let, let's be clear here. I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, we get it. We've got it completely right, Ferguson. But we were very fortunate for a number of reasons. One, as I explained, we, we had already embarked on our, automation and technology journey back in 2008 or 2010. But by the time we got to the pandemic, we'd already implemented a cloud-based solution in 2015, which is uh, Bellin or rather Cooper today. Uh, and a lot of the technology that we currently have had already been implemented by then. So we had a very automated process. So with the pandemic struck, we were, and also one other point I want to do add to this, in terms of our group's evolution, particularly in the UK, we had moved offices and in moving offices, we'd also, the management decided to allow, or not to allow, sorry, you should say, selected offices that were, first of all, quite modern. So they had the kind of like, um, you know, pods and sort of meeting booths that you can kind of like plug and play, you know, very dynamic, very kind of uh, what, 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 like a WeWorks uh, type uh, scenario. And they also allowed us to work remotely. At that point, it was one day a week. So you could already see, and this is back in 2017, well, not that we knew there was a pandemic and it happened, but we were kind of prepared for that sort of eventuality. Well, from day one, we had very little disruption from a treasury perspective to the, the operational uh, work that we're doing. Our challenge, frankly, and I know we'll talk about this later, was frankly the banks. The banks were not set up to work remotely. And thankfully, they very quickly agreed to uh, uh, take digitized documents. So that, that was just a small part, example of uh, how the banks adapted then. But then we can look at today. And the way I see today in terms of treasury functions, generally speaking, and this is very broadly based, there are a significant number of corporates that still use Excel spreadsheets in lieu of a TMS solution or any type of technology. I'm not going to say that spreadsheets are bad they're not because i use spreadsheets everyone i feel it uses it as a tool where i draw the line though personally is that in this current day and age i feel that the technology that's available whether it's a tms solution or some other perhaps maybe lighter form of uh, technology that enables you to digitize your, your transactions and to enable you to be more future proof as i call it uh, and also not to mention being secure from a cybersecurity perspective. I think this doesn't excuse the fact 
uh, or the the option of using spreadsheets for that, in my view. And they're, they're relatively more cost effective, in my view. And then you've got a fair you know, percentage of corporates that use cloud-based solutions like Ferguson, which I think is increasing as we as each day goes by. But there is a third group, which maybe use, like Ferguson, both Excel and cloud-based solutions, but it's the advanced AI machine learning technologies that we haven't quite mastered yet, Ferguson, but we are very interested in. But I know corporate treasurers that are not only using this technology, but have actually you know studied it in, in, in great detail and great land. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the programming aspect, like some treasurers are interested in Python and, and so on and so forth. Because frankly, at the end of the day, you know, it, for the vast majority of people uh, and treasurers, I would imagine you want to be able to use the product where you can add value. And not everyone's going to be necessarily inclined to go into the programming language that, that let's say, Python or some of these other uh, software solutions can offer. But the thing that has been a game changer, and this is why I believe life and treasury suddenly taken a new dimension for me. A year ago, AI was touted as a big buzzword, as was APIs and, and some, a lot of other terms that were used. But where the landscape's changed for me is with not only ChatGPT, but Microsoft's Copilot. There are a number of other technologies and companies out there that basically democratized AI for the vast public, for the public. And so really anyone without any knowledge or expertise in programming can now get the benefit and begin to use AI in a very powerful way. And there's so much more that really needs to be said about AI, but I know we haven't got the time to do that here. But one very quick point I want to add in terms of when I mentioned AI. So we know ChatGPT3 exists out there. And I first came across it last year when it was first released. I was very excited about it then. But I was attending a conference recently this last week, actually, which is looking at future or transformational technologies by, by, uh, hosted by a bank, a large US bank. And I was very, um, how should I say, challenged and inspired, frankly, to hear the chat GBT3 is quite, how do I put it, outdated in, in terms of the chat GPT4 that's now being created or is available, let's say, or is going to be rolled out. And interestingly, they're calling it chat GPT4, and I'll put this in inverted commas with common sense. Now, that sounds pretty powerful because they are, if you look de uh, deeply enough to chat GPT3, you'll see that when you put in certain questions, it doesn't always come up with a very sensible answer. And there are loads of analogies, and you can look this up on the net, was ChatGPT4 is actually being designed to consider your question and come up with a very sensible and rational answer. Now, obviously, a lot of what I've talk, spoken about so far, you could argue, has nothing to do with Treasury in, in, per se. But at the same time, I'll say, this is... The technology that we should be looking at and we should be uh, aware of and it is and will be used more widely in treasury even if it's not necessarily something that you are you know has ai on the front of it certainly behind the solution that you'll be looking to use ai will and and, and certain other technology will be very much at the base of that, that solution i'm just going to stop there because i i, I sense you might have a question or two <laughs> No, but that's that's absolutely great. So thanks for, for this restaurant. Lots, lots to unpack. First of all, I really enjoyed the analogy with a Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3 in the way we, and obviously treasurers as well, uh, first consume data only and consume information only, then switch to a bit more of an exchange, uh, not completely equal exchange yet, but it's like consuming and giving a bit of input, and then being part of the execution, giving that feedback. And when we liaise with technology, it's also being able to have the implementation in-house, to set things up, to be in relationship with a different system and implementation and um, technology vendors. So I like that analogy. To maybe deep dive into one of the things you mentioned and to highlight the role and benefits of technology in Treasury. What do you think would have happened if you would have not had a cloud-based solution in place during the pandemic at Ferguson? You said, luckily, we were already implementing some cloud-based technology. Like, 
what did that enable? What did that allow you to do that would have not been possible if the technology wasn't there? I think for, you know, like any corporate treasury function, you can't look at what your processes that you run on a day-to-day -day basis. Frankly, before the pandemic, I think most corporate treasury functions for large companies would have some sort of uh, business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan. So this was very much part of our DNA. And, and we, if we go back 10, 15 years, there was the, the, the shared, um, quite comically in a way, thinking about it, what, what you can do today, you'd have a hot site. So the, the, the general scenario is if you're, let's go for a bit, a building burns down or is about to burn up, you'd go to the hot site and you'd work there. Clearly with Wi-Fi, that's not a requirement anymore. And in fact, we always thought about this before, again, the pandemic would say, okay, well, buildings are inaccessible. We just go to the local, you know, whatever coffee shop there is that has Wi-Fi and we work from there. But actually, we can work from home now. So the point being is one is about connectivity, right? Because you want to be able to connect and we have to make the assumption, even if you haven't got cloud-based solution, that you still need to connect to your banks and to get, you know to, to obtain reports and and sort of make payments. So there's an assumption here in terms of the the timing around this, because how far do you go back in terms of saying, well, without this technology, the cloud-based solutions, what would you do? And I don't think it'd be helpful, in my view, to talk about say what was in place 20 years ago, because clearly. That's not you know, realistic. But I would say if we didn't have cloud, certainly going back 10, yeah, 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, a lot of our were based upon logging onto a computer, logging into a banking solution or into spreadsheet onto our network. So you'd expect at the very least we'd be looking to do that. But as I said, having the cloud gave us, gave us that independence, that flexibility to work remotely. Without that, I think, there would have been challenges. I mean, I've heard stories about companies having to ship computers to the, for their staff to work on from well, remotely and from home. So we have laptops or, you know, we had laptops. So we are, again, able to continue working, you know, sort of uninterrupted. I think security is a big issue and was a big issue rather. It wasn't so much for us, but it was for a lot of companies because you're working in a very secure, generally more secure environment when you're, you know, thinking back to, you know, working in an office environment and using your your offices or your company's broadband with and so on and so forth. But frankly, and again, it's hard to kind of sort of try and, you know, give up an explanation in terms of what would life be like without that? Because apart from, it's a kind of fairly binary option where you're either in the office or you're working from home. But all I can say is certainly from Ferguson's perspective, with the technology that we had and also the infrastructure our network and the security that we've got uh, within our internal network helped protect us. So as much as I did use and I do use our my local broadband, when I log into my company's uh, network, it's using all the embedded technology and security that they have to offer. And I think nowadays for large corporates, you can't, avoid you know i think one one answer to that question i just thought about is vpn right virtual private network so in the past you'd have to actually log in to the vpn to be able to connect to your company securely nowadays it's not particularly necessary because again the technology has evolved and it's improved so our company has you know the, the, the right stru structure for us to do that um say yeah and i it's particularly interesting to hear, especially given that certain companies still don't have a TMS, let alone a cloud-based TMS. Like big players, big companies are still a bit delayed in their technology transformation, let's say. Therefore, are facing all the issues that you're mentioning here. And another point that I think is particularly interesting is everybody we talk uh, with on the Corporate Treasure 101 podcast and outside of it, Everybody agrees on one point, which is talents are hard to find, to attract and to retain. But like being able to work remotely is definitely one of the criteria that needs to be met, especially for the younger generations. So I like how that highlights the importance of technology in treasury in particular. Um, and the last one, uh, last question that I'd like to explore with you, Royston, uh, based on what you said, artificial intelligence. So you gave a little bit of an update on ChatGPT and you did do some very interesting advancement there. But what are you doing 
at Ferguson, or maybe what do you see as being an AI-enabled treasury task handling, let's say, or what would you like to do with AI beyond the chat GPT and the large language models? There's a good question now. Oh, my word. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a limitless landscape, in my view, with AI. I, I, I Don't get me wrong. I mean, as I said, I'm not a technical expert when it comes to a lot of these technologies, but I do see the value in the potential benefits that they have to, 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 to lend and so on. So I would look to the fintechs and the banks to some degree, certainly our internal IT department, to guide me when we're looking at potential solutions. But to answer your question, very simply, cash flow forecasting. This is one of the top pain points that most treasurers always put in in, in terms of their top three uh, sort of, uh, categories for, for what you know, that keeps them awake at night, whatever you like to call it. And what, I've looked at solutions uh, in my 35 years in treasury, and there are some really, really good cash um, play forecast solutions out there today. What I think what AI is going to do, particularly in the next year, is it's going to break down the glass walls because I feel that, I mean, we're no different in some respects and that we have certain challenges internally in being able to get all the data centralized because we are a collection of businesses and we have so many disparate systems. And most solutions out there, although they will claim to to be able to you know work with you know whatever situation you've got, where you've got internal challenges in how you get that data, this is what AI is looking to do now. I think, and AI is helping and will help. I think companies like Bergson to get to a point where we're able to you know really harness a lot of the inefficiencies that might exist in terms of, you know, sort of communication between systems or, or sometimes departments. Now, in many ways, AI, it really depends on how imaginative or creative you want to be. And I do keep, whenever I say that, I keep thinking also, I know there's a lot of noise around security and, and, and I'm fully conscious of that. But to, from my perspective, as long as, you know, you're doing whatever you do whenever you look at a solution or implement a solution. You follow your due diligence. You follow your protocols, your IT department have set. You know, you, you, you don't just go for the first solution that comes through along and so on and so forth. Then, you know, you can't do any more than that. And so, therefore, the way the world evolves, in my view, and if you look at anything like even cryptocurrency, there are many reasons why treasures want uh, engage and 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 not and we don't need that, folks, for that matter, because the volatility involved. And the reason I'm using cryptocurrency as example is just to demonstrate that some of these areas need time to develop and evolve. Doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that they're not right for the industry or the, the, the you know for us now. I still believe. In, in, in digital currency, frankly. And so we'll come back to that later. But coming back to your question about AI, AI permeates all sorts of areas. So I mentioned cash flow forecasting. There's another technology that's a, uh, that's a particular favorite of mine called digital twins. And why I think that's a great uh, technology is because for me, digital twins is really, it's like a virtual representation of an object or system that spans its life cycle. In other words, and it's also it updates from real time data and uses like simulation, machine learning, and reasoning to help decision making. There's already huge applications in, in, in the commercial world in uh, people in Norway they're using it in the bridges and in, in lots of automobile industry they're using it in uh, to look at uh, to, to develop car building cars. Why do I think it's important in treasury? Well for a simple reason that if you set up a digital twin of your treasury function in, in the ether, you could then begin to plan and you know sort of calculate in advance what would be the impact if this happened. For example, a pandemic. But it could also obviously be applied to FX hedging, um, commodity hedging, all sorts of other risks that we currently manage. 
And this is why I think digital twins is so exciting. But as I say, with AI, it, it is really better for Pandora's box. But slowly but surely, each day goes by. I'm seeing more and more very positive, very exciting solutions coming out from either fintechs or banks. And also closer to home, I mentioned Microsoft Copilot. Well, one of the things that I've found, in, and this is with a colleague of mine at work, you can actually use Copilot to automate any process you want. It might be a bit crude in the sense that I'm sure solution or fintech could do a much better job. But frankly, if you're, you've got a process, it might be fairly manual at the moment, like uh, let's say approving payments. Copilot will write the program for you. You don't even have to do the program yourself, write the program yourself. And they will even provide you an app you can set up an app where you can get your approvers to log into the app and confirm they've approved the payment. It's little steps, admittedly, but it's important that if you're not, not only aware that this exists today, but be also conscious that we've got a new generation coming to the workplace who are completely familiar with smart technology and are probably more familiar with this type of technology. So. I know we're going to come to that question later. Can you imagine what the Treasury in five, seven, even 10 years' time is going to look like? I certainly didn't envisage it would be this quick because I was asked this question, I think, five years ago by a famous recruitment consultant. I'm sure you know who he is. And I was saying, well, in 10 years' time, I think you know we'll be working remotely and it will be on mostly online and what have you. And obviously, unfortunately, with the pandemic, but... Looking at the positives, we've we've seen how much more value we've got from in terms of what we're using, the technology we're using, and and, and in terms of um, flexible working. Super interesting, Rosen. Everything you said is super super interesting. However, <laughs> I have one uh, one thing I would like to say. My experience with Treasury is that the Treasury is the most risk adverse department in the organization. What the f <laughs> sure, uh, and, uh, and um, these technologies are, I don't know if they're risky, AI might get there, become risky, um, but certainly uh, implementing any technology, changing processes, even for a financial gain, can be quite difficult, especially in treasury departments. Um, what do you see are the biggest barriers to implementing these kind of technologies in treasury departments? That's a very good question, actually, because you're absolutely right. This is the area I keep coming against time and time again. And, you know, I'm not, my job is not to convert or convince anyone that they need to use technology or the use of this type of technology. I would say I would want to share what I know and what I see and hopefully try and encourage treasures to be more open-minded because frankly at the end of the day whatever place you're at in terms of your personal position I always default to the fact that I imagine nine out of ten treasurers if not all ten have a smartphone and if you've got a smartphone I find it very hard to understand or believe that you don't engage with some sort of technology in fact I would imagine there's some treasures that probably have a a lot more technology in their phone than they may admit to using in the workplace. And this is not, again, unusual because historically, like you said, we are very conservative. We are, we, we are gatekeepers and risk managers for our company in terms of you know the uh, financial assets. And so it's a good reason for us to be cautious and conservative. But I don't think that mantra or that mentality can work anymore for the simple reason that you only have to look at the last even five or ten years and observe those companies that refuse to pay attention to let's say the writing on the wall uh, in terms of technology in terms of how they've not survived or, or been, uh, succeeded and then on the other hand you look at the largest fintechs or not fintechs largest companies in the world whether it's an Amazon, Google, Microsoft, not surprisingly, these are technology companies. So, I mean, I, I'm kind of doing a broad brush approach to this, but you, you know, you're absolutely right. 
I did uh, do an article. It was mainly designed at the US market because it's going back four or five years where the, the question you've just posed was exactly up, which is why would the treasures need to change? And there's this also, this, uh, I hate the expression, but it is quite appropriate. So if it ain't broke, why fix it? And, and don't get me wrong. I, I'm also very much against finding a solution for a problem that doesn't exist or fixing something for the sake of fixing it. But again, when I look at those expressions or those, com those, those statements, I say to myself, where am I today? I'm in 2023. I am surrounded by technology, not me personally, in society. Wherever you go, if you travel, you're engaging with technology. You've got your, your biometric passport, generally speaking. Now, tell me one person that would say, actually, I'd quite like to go back to, without, where the, to a world where there's no smartphone. There's no you know, internet. I know, I get it. There are times <laughs> when we all want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, from a business perspective, we need these technologies. We need to engage them. But I also understand this is not something that you can get involved in very easily. I was fortunate in terms of my journey, in terms of where I was. I was almost led into this, and but I also wanted it. That, so I did have a, a passion and desire for it. It does help. But the question that comes up a lot, and it's very similar to the one you just asked, is, well, how do I go about getting myself, if you are open to technology and you want to get into understanding what's happening, well, I say quite often, you don't have to, you know, jump into the deep one. And, and as a treasure, you wouldn't. But you can go to light touch. You can look at your banking partners. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Look at your vendors. But then if you're not maybe blessed with, the, with a huge amount of choice there, go online and look up some of the technology. There's a host of material in terms of the treasure, uh, the HD journal, Treasury Today. TMI, there's lots of treasury and conferences, frankly, and not to mention your podcast. So thank you. you. Know, there, Oof, there, 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 there. Like, is he going to say it? Is he going to say it? <laughs> of course, your podcast. I mean, <laughs> frankly, these are the kind of source the resources that are so widely available. And frankly, again, this is the other point in terms of technology. You don't even have to be physically listening to this uh, at the time it's released. You can, right. you can listen it to, in, in, at any time you want. So there's no real excuse, in my view, for treasurers and people generally going out there, or not even going out there, just making themselves aware and, and, and kind, of, um, kind of equipping themselves with the information. But I do understand it is a bit of a minefield. So coming back to what I said about the banks, the banks are a great resource, absolutely great resource, for the simple reason they have the financial, most banks, the large banks, uh, resource to do this. But quite often they are so keen and willing to engage with you as a customer. Like I did, I say, I went to this conference where they kind of put on a showcase for transforming technologies. I and mean, it's amazing the stuff and the people that were presenting there were people that went to Bletchley Park. So they you know, they're seriously intelligent, seriously, you know, sort of industry leaders. But this is one of our nation banks that put on this, um, this, this uh, conference. And so equally I would encourage treasures. I know it's, you have to make time, but these aren't conferences you have to attend every week, once a year. But it's definitely worth the investment because, you know, it's even, you mentioned AI, there's APIs, there's in cyber fraud, we could talk about that in a minute. But, you know, it's all of these areas that are kind of probably areas that we don't, as treasures, gravitate to naturally. But I think in this day and age, you can't afford to ignore them.